Um, so I have 10 minutes of lecture remaining. What I would like to do is I want to do my version of this derivation that's done in the textbook. And so that you know where it is. In your textbook, it's in the section 4.2 of the textbook. And this is how they do it. They do it using some phaser diagram. And it takes them very long time to work through. You can read through it. And I think it will be good exercise for somebody to read through it. So do that. But I can tell you this. There's no way I can do this in 10 minutes. Uh, where, where's the result? OK, so that's the result that they obtain. There's no way I can do that in 10 minutes. <laughs> what I'm telling you now is I can do it in 10 minutes using this formalism we introduced the last time. The, so the reason that's such a complicated, long, difficult argument is they have to do it geometrically. They have to draw phasers. They have to do all that. And it's a, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. But one thing that's, uh, um, I don't know, almost magical about the complex exponential is it provides a very natural bridge between algebra and geometry. I showed you how this uh, gives you meaning to the complex plane. So let me use this tool to do this calculation. Um, there, uh, so, so this is the um, argument that we are going to make. So let's say intensity of single solid diffraction. And you do have to you know, set up the physical situation, because simply writing down expressions that don't mean anything doesn't actually help. So for intensity of single slit diffraction, this is the setup that I'm physically imagining. I have a slit of size A. I'm going to use the same letter as your lab. And I'm considering the light rays that are going to some screen very far away. And so this time, because I have to consider arbitrary angles, I can no longer make that argument about breaking this up into time, breaking this up into some even number that will pair up into destructive interference. I can't do that. I want some general expression. So let me just label a few things. Mm. So, the, um, so these light rays, they are going off at some angle theta. And that will correspond to, to this light um, landing on some spot on the screen somewhere. Yeah? And conceptually, I think this is how I can do it. So if I could somehow calculate, if I could somehow calculate the total electric field of all this um, arriving with the different phases, add it up together, and I take that and square it, then that would be my intensity. Right? Yeah, and so conceptually, it's pretty simple. You have all these different light rays contributing some amount of electric field. Add them up, square it, you get intensity. Yeah? And so this total electric field, so with a double slit, we added two expressions for electric field. So here, it would be a. I guess, um, so I guess I could write this as a sum of um, small contribution. Oh, I don't have a proper letter for this. Well, I guess I could label each one of these uh, rays 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Goes up to some big number n. And I could uh, you know, have contribution from each one of those electric fields. i goes from 1 to n. Add them up. That will be the total electric field. That's the superposition principle, right? Um, now, that, that could give me some um, approximate formula. But I don't want anything approximate. I want exact formula. What's the step that goes from this uh, approximate electric, total electric field to an exact expression for electric field? Infinity. So you make the number of um, rays infinite. So in your math class, what did you call that? Integral, Integral yeah. Rem so yeah, this is the Riemann sum. And the st when you turn that, make, make the Riemann sum exact, that's the integral. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to represent this instead as, 
I have a small contribution to the electric field. And uh, let me use this parameter to label it. So let's say this is my x-axis. And my x starts from 0, goes to some value. So this small contribution to electric field will be parameterized with x. And I integrate this from x equals 0 to a over the entire slit. That should give me the exact value of the total electric field. And when I square that, that's what gives me the intensity. So conceptually, it's actually a pretty simple calculation. What you will realize is that when you try to do this with the real functions, the math will just overwhelm you. And this is where I'm claiming that if you use complex exponential, you can do this calculation in the four remaining minutes. So let me do that. I'm going to express, uh, I'm just imagining some um, electric field from one spot there that I'm going to express that small contribution to electric field as some amplitude times um, e to the i omega t, that's the time dependent oscillating part, times e to the i some phase factor that's going to be a function of x. And let me go actually one more step. I'm going to, this time, because I have to do the integral, so I kind of have to know the expression, I'm going to write down what this is. And I can write it down from the geometry consideration. Let's say this is at some point x away from here. Then you, you know, do the same thing that we've been doing before. This path length difference, I don't know, lowercase delta, that, uh, um, that's x times sine theta, path length difference. Oh, that is the path length difference. So that'll give me the phase factor of, so that'll give me phase factor of x sine theta um, divided by lambda times 2 pi. That's my phase factor. Good? All right. Um, so let me actually write that out. So that's equal to e naught e to the i omega t times e to the uh, i 2 pi over lambda, 2 pi over lambda times sine theta x. All right, so this is my expression for infinitesimal contribution to the electric field. Let me integrate. So for the total electric field, what I need is I need to integrate. Integrate it from x equals 0 to a. Integrate it with respect to x from x equals 0 to a. Now, because these are all exponentials, this is actually a remarkably simple integral, even though it looks complicated. This is constant, constant. Here, everything is constant except for x here, meaning this is the integral. When you do the integral, you get this. e naught e to the i omega t, that was, you know, constant, and this, um, so I need the integral of this, which would be, to remember the antiderivative. So it would be lambda over i times 2 pi sine theta times e to the i 2 pi over lambda sine theta x. Did I do the antiderivative correctly? OK. Evaluate it from 0 to a. So, um, so when I plug in a, this is what. So let me write that, write out what's evaluated. Oh, I may have uh, underestimated <laughs> time needed. So e naught e to the i omega t times lambda over i two pi sine theta times uh, plugging in a, I get e to the i two pi over lambda a sine theta i 2 pi over lambda a sine theta. And then plugging in 0, I get 1. e to the i 0 is 1. So minus 1. So this is the expression we get for the total electric field. 
And since it does seem like I'm out of time, let me tell you uh, what to needing to be done. And just uh, let's get a sense of if you feel like you can do it. <laughs> since I'm out of time, sorry. I need uh, two more minutes to actually finish the calculation. Um, so before um, we did the real functions, what we would need to do is we would have to square it and then do the time average, right? Using this special case, all we need to do is take that, multiply with a, with a complex conjugate. When we do that, actually, some of these are going to go away. e to the i omega t, that's just going to be 1. i times minus i, that's also going to be 1. So a lot of these will simplify. You will still have this dependence on theta that's kind of a little bit weird on the outside. And the most complicated part algebraically will be working out this portion. This times its complex conjugate. Does that feel like something you can do maybe in five minutes? Yeah. And what I'm telling you is when you do that, you get the resulting expression. Compare what you see with one of these two. You'll get cosine theta by comparing, doing the comparison. And that will be the same result that's in the textbook. And it didn't quite take 10 minutes, but I could have done it in 15 minutes. Um, and so, uh, so this is the reason I introduced the complex exponential early. And you will see these complex functions more uh, later in the semester when we do quantum mechanics. So uh, it's good to get used to now.